What's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Some Men's Comics. We're here to kick off your comic book week with another top 10 back issues for to be on the lookout for, right? That's right. We've got 10 back issues, a lot of affordable picks, a uh, brand new volume. This kicks off volume three of this top 10 back issue series. So we're really excited for that. Didn't imagine we'd be this deep into it, but got some great buys for you this week. A lot of stuff with a lot of reason to be moving up in the future. Uh, definitely one you want to be paying attention to. Yes. Good thing about this list is this one's actually kind of super current. Right. But we're going to talk about that in a minute because we're starting right now with number 10. And then get us in the bottom of that list. We just got news that that last Ronin has been pushed back and people are asking about, hey, what about that ash can? Well, here it is on the list at number 10 this week. All right, now the ash can came in with a lot of free comic book day stuff. It was a free giveaway to stores. Stores did not give it away. It was definitely going for about $40 on release day. And that's pretty indicative of like a first appearance of a popular miniseries coming up. And this has a lot of hype with the return of Eastman and Laird to the Ninja Turtle family. And this is a story, a script they really wrote in 1987 that they are now just putting into final fruition. But the reason why this is on the list really doesn't have anything to do with the last Ronin hype, which is immense. It has to do with some news that's popped off in the last 24 hours. Now we're recording this on Thursday night. You guys are going to see this on Monday. But on Wednesday, there was news that the last run and pushed back several months because retailers did not like the interior art of the preview, this ash can itself. So Andy Kuhn, who was the interior artist, was let go from the book and two new interior artists were brought on. This means that the only depiction of this art that's going to exist is going to be this ash can. Um, I think this could create a unique collectible as the actual book itself will not look the same as the ash can. So this ash can is going to be kind of a unique, rare TMNT collectible. It's already got value in the fact that, like, it's a preview of probably the most hyped thing in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles lore in the last 20 years. So we could talk about this ash can even if there wasn't a change in the creative team. But the change in the creative team, to me, really brings this thing over the top. Yeah, it's going to be like the Ninja Turtle version of the Grey Hulk. Yes. And it's at the nine spot. This is a book that just released within the past couple weeks. And we're talking about Seven Secrets number one, which quickly became Boom Studios' top selling pre order book, right? That's right. And I might catch some heat for this one because I realized this book just came out on Wednesday. I also fully oh, am aware, full transparency, we have an exclusive variant by Jung Young Yoon available on simplemanscomics.com as well as 616comics.com uh, of the first print limited to 500. We also have two covers by Gleb Melnikoff, homaging the second print, first appearance of Miles Morales in Ultimate Fallout 4, that regular second print cover, as well as the second print variant. And we have limited to 100 exclusive versions of those books. Again, those are available on simplemanscomics.com and the 616comics.com. But that's not even why I talk about this. It really has nothing to do with the exclusives that we have developed. It really has to do with what you said, Brad. Now, we saw the heat from Something's Killing the Children. Now, imagine if you could go back in time in a year and you could get in on Something's Killing the Children on the ground floor. Well, you have the opportunity to do that with Seven Secrets because... While Something's Killing the Children was this groundbreaking book of 2019 for Boom Studios, Seven Secrets has eclipsed all sales numbers that Something's Killing the Children put up. And we know that this is just the beginning of where this is going. The second print is already sold out ahead of release. They're already soliciting a third print. We know that this is going to be something that continues. And here's the best part. Brian, you and I have read issue number two already. It gets better. The book is better in issue two than one. So if you're reading issue one and you're loving it, you're going to love issue number two. So this would be my suggestion. Don't, I know that there's cover price copies of that first print sitting on the shelves at LCSs. Do not let them sit there too much longer. You will regret it. And Boom Studios is on a run. I don't think this is the only time we're going to be talking about some of their new releases because, Brian, you mentioned that they set a sales record with this book, but that sales record has already been broken by the upcoming We Only Find Them When They're Dead, number one, from Al Ewing, and even that's expected to be broken by Berserker from Keanu Reeves. Yeah, it's huge success that Boom's having right now. Some great stories. Tom Taylor, fantastic writer. We've talked about him before. Yes. And you mentioned about that third print they just solicited. Well, if you're watching this Monday night when this premieres, it hit FOC tonight for that Seven Secrets third print. Here we have hitting us at that eight spot. We have that Batman New 52 issue number seven. 
That's right. Now, we've talked about a lot of these issues in the New 52, which I think is great because it's a slept on run right now. So when you hit those LCS back issue bins, this is a run you'll find the key still in. Um, a lot of people focus on issue number one, but now we're starting to pay attention to some of these other issues. Issue seven is the first appearance of Harper Row. Now, this kind of comes uh, a little bit, again, before what she's going to fully become. Harper first appears kind of in cameo in issue number one. This is that full appearance. This is kind of the more desirable appearance and the more under-the-radar appearance. As obviously, number one gets heat just from the fact that that was a really monumental landmark issue in Batman history. But I would pay attention to this issue number seven. Everything that we've got coming on with the punchline one-shot, with the fact that James Tynan is writing the, uh, the current Batman run. He's a very big fan of these kind of newer Bat family characters. He implements them a lot into his stories, and a lot of retailers are very bullish on some of these newer Bat family characters. Which kind of carries us into the seventh spot, which you're going to go with Batman issue number 28 of that new 52 run, right? Right, and that's where Harper Row becomes Bluebird. Now, similar to like Cletus Cassidy and Carnage, there's always a bit more value on the kind of superhero character first appearance versus the regular person first appearance. So I like 28 better than seven, but Bluebird is definitely a character who has become kind of an important part of the Bat family story, kind of slowly growing organic popularity created by James Tynan. Now he is the writer here on, on Batman. I think this is a character you're going to see more of in the future. Which if you're getting those two, you can also go into our number six spot. We're talking about Detective Comics number 647. Right now, we're talking, of course, Stephanie Brown. Now, Stephanie Brown has had so many monikers. She's been Robin. You know, she's been uh, Batgirl. She's been a little bit of everything. 647 is her first appearance. Um, again, first appearing as Stephanie Brown herself. Definitely a back issue that I've seen ups and downs. It's currently kind of quiet. Now is the time I would be picking this one up. And if you're already digging through those long boxes for Detective 647, let's move on into our next pick. And you might as well keep looking and get Detective 648 as well, because that is Stephanie Brown's first appearance as Spoiler. And while she would go on to play some other characters, as I mentioned, like Robin and Batgirl, she makes her return to Spoiler in the New 52, and that is the character she currently depicts now in the series. Very cool character. Uh, almost reminds me, Brian, of Ronin from Marvel, uh, kind of in the look and costume, but definitely a character that James Tynan likes to use. Definitely a character that I, as I've mentioned, has grown in organic popularity over the last few years, and one that I think is going to show up more and more in, in, in the publishing story and plays in with Punchline very well. Also, it is only a matter of time, and I know this is like kind of high end, but it's only a matter of time before the Bat family is properly depicted in a, a feature film. That's what I want. I, I, I'm done with the Dark Knight, like brooding, angry, my parents got killed, Batman. I'm, I'm ready to move on to some new stories. I want Damien. I want Spoiler. I want Bluebird. Uh, give us Duke Thomas. Let's, 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 let's do a Bat family movie. And I think eventually that has to happen. And when it does happen, these books will be nuclear. Yeah. The signal. Bring them out. Bring them out. So we are now at the fourth spot on the list this week. And we just talked about these recently in the last call last and last week's last call show, as well as the Bolo show. But here we are right now saying these are great ones to pick up. And we're talking about those Star Wars, John Tyler Christopher action figure variants, right? That's right. I think long-term, these are going to be books that Star Wars fans are going to want. Star Wars fans have been putting these together all throughout the run. And while the secondary market jumped on early, as some of these were spiking to 10 to $15, once they started falling off and not selling out at retail and retailers started ordering them heavily, suddenly the secondary market didn't care anymore. And I started buying these books for a dollar from Midtown and TFAW sales. Um, yeah, a lot lesser characters, but even characters like Chewie and Lando and characters like that ended up on discount. Um, more than happy to grab those. So this is, the, I have regularly at conventions had a section of action figure variant covers from Star Wars, and they sell. Kids love them. Star Wars fans who aren't hardcore comics guys don't really care about all the things that you care about. They love these. Um, John Tyler Christopher really hit a home run with these. I know he got kind of burnt out for a while, but he recently put out the message that he is coming back and coming back with a vengeance, and we're going to see him 
with the return to Star Wars number six, the 125 action figure variant, um, definitely going to get a lot of people's attention. But that's the thing is we, we are getting to a point now where I think we have to look at these a little differently. Like people get kind of wrapped up when variants are being released about, you know, accessibility and demand, but demand and accessibility change as time progresses. And I don't think a lot of these are going to be available as cheap as they were in the coming years. And because of that, and especially because of the rise in Star Wars comic collectability, I really think that long term that the, this as a set, albeit a, a monstrous size set, is going to be one that people are going to be chasing. Yeah, no, no one could ever say that Star Wars won't be relevant down years down the road. Right. And it's great because, like you said, there were some that Marvel actually had with the regular printing, but then John Tyler Christopher also did a bunch of exclusives for his website, like Emperor Palpatine. There was one recently that I love, one of my favorite characters from Return of the Jedi is the Rancor, and he had this awesome, almost wraparound Rancor action figure mm -hmm. bought a couple of those. So, yeah, Star Wars fan of me loves to pick those up, and if I can find them for cheap, like you're saying, the pennies on the dollar right now, definitely add them to my collection. Definitely. We are now into the top three, and at number three this week, we have that Fantastic Four annual number six. Yeah, now, obviously, this is already an expensive book. It was a book that two years ago, savvy speculators were picking up for around $10, but regularly now selling for in that mid-grade condition, $100, $150. Um, still a book, though, that every now and again, you can find an unsuspecting dealer underpricing, especially in that lower grade, but this is often picked up for a nihilist. That's what everyone talks about. That's why everyone's on this. It's not why I like this book, though, Brian. I like this book for Franklin Richards. There's a lot of reports that the upcoming Fantastic Four movie, which is rumored to be helmed by John Krasinski, is going to immediately jump into the story where we see this team and the Fantastic Four kind of later in their incarnation, not origin style. We're going to get them kind of fully formed. And there's rumors that you're going to get them with Franklin Richards. Um, having, you know, the son of Sue Storm and Reed Richards. And I think that that reason alone should have spiked this book, but it really didn't. So this is one that I think as valuable as it is, is still undervalued as those rumors could bear some, some, some actual results. And even the talk of rumors, if those things kind of continue and we get towards casting, um, that's going to be something that's going to be picked up. And then either way, even if the Franklin Richards thing never pays out, a nihilist is a character people are expecting to see um, as a major villain in the upcoming Fantastic Four franchise. Right on. Hitting us at that next to top spot this week at number two, we get that A-Force number one from 2015. This one we've talked about on this channel as well, especially with that Avengers Endgame kind of seemed to be teasing something similar when they had all those female superheroes on in the one scene, right? That's right. This is, you know, every sweaty Cheeto eating wife beater tucked up over their belly comic book fam who's slamming into their keyboard right now telling me how much they hate Carol Danvers and how she's going to be killed off in the movies. This is their worst nightmare, Brad. The idea that A-Force could possibly be a movie. We could see an all-female Avengers, all the actresses, associated with the Marvel Cinematic Universe have gone on record saying that they want this, that they would love the opportunity to do this. I got to be honest with you, and I don't care how corny anybody views me. I have two daughters. I get almost emotional at the scene where they all get together because I sit there and I think to myself, I, as a child, couldn't imagine us getting to a point where we saw an Avengers movie. Can you, do you even um, remember what it was like when that first Avengers movie came out. And, we, and a good Avengers movie at that. Yeah, and we saw them all together and Hulk and Thor, and it was incredible, right? And it validated all of our childhoods. Now, I love the fact that young female fans could possibly get that same opportunity with an A-Force movie. I think there's so much uh, of a story that could be told. I think these comics were great. I think that this comic is definitely a sleeper. Uh, it gets popular because a lot of people are on board. As ma I made the joke about, you know, the, the angry comic book guy type of comic book guy. And they, they exist. Um, and we certainly see them in the comment section. But for every one of those, there's also some great people who want to see the comic kind of um, community progress and, and, and 
be more inclusive to everybody. And I think A Force could do a great thing for that. I've never liked the A Force name, I must uh, I must admit, but I, I say I think why can't they just be the Avengers and just be all females? Um, and I think I think that could work. But either way, I think this is a book long term to pay attention to. This book is going to spike prime whether there's an A Force movie or not. Anytime that a few of these women come together for like a scene in the movie, just like you were saying with the breadcrumbs and Endgame, everybody's going to get excited. Coming in at the number one spot this week, we all know there's a Venom Wraith series coming up, but great ones to pick up are the Wraith Annihilation series as well, right? That's right. And this is another one, Brian, where you're getting kind of dual play on uh, one property. There is a lot of talk about Wraith showing up in the upcoming MCU in some form or fashion. And because of that, there's a lot of heat on the character. And that stuff Marvel pays attention to. So those back issues have been spiking. They've been reprinting trades and things like that. Marvel's paying attention. On top of that, Wraith has been kind of brought into the Venom lore. And we know how popular Venom is. Is there a Marvel character more popular than Venom? I really don't think so. So because of that, and because that's happening on both fronts, you're seeing incredible spikes with this book. Now, normally, we sit here and say a book that's spiked like this, it's probably already seen its day. But all of this is spiked based on speculation, Brian. Wraith hasn't showed up in a movie, and we really don't have any sort of confirmation about what Wraith's relationship with Venom is yet. You know, it could be a Wraith of time. (laughs) (laughs) So that's one of those things where... (laughs) Because because we know <laughs> you got me on that one. Uh, <laughs> because we don't know yet definitively where Wraith is going to play out, there's still room for this book and this entire mini series to grow. So this is one I would grab. Here's my suggestion. A lot of times when I'm looking for this book, I don't find issue number one, but I will find two, three, four. Grab two, three, four. Don't worry about issue one. You can pick up issue one by itself. But if you can pick up two, three, four from the back issue bins and you don't have to go to eBay, you're going to save yourself some money. Yeah, so there it is, guys. There's our top 10 back issues to be on the lookout for this week. We had some more current ones, but we felt they deserved a spot on here for the first week of volume number three of these videos. But we also have some more exciting news, right? This is Monday night. In two days' time, this coming Wednesday, August 19th, we have something else, don't we, Jack? That's right. Now, we told you guys, we're getting in the exclusive variant game, and we're not dipping our toes in. We're jumping in head first in the deep end. So you've already seen Seven Secrets, number one. You've already seen Seven Secrets, number one, the second print. And you've already seen Draken New Dawn, number one. And now, on Wednesday, we drop two brand-new releases, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. First up, we have Stargazer number one from Mad Cave Studios, brand new Virgin variant, limited to just 200 copies and at the low price of $14.99. And again, that goes on sale this Wednesday at 9 p.m. But also, that's not the only thing. We mentioned earlier, Seven Secrets, great buy. We created some exclusives, but it just got upended by Al Ewing and we only find them when they're dead, number one, the upcoming series from Boom Studios. So, of course, we had to jump in on that one. So we've got a brand new John Boyd Myers uh, 500 print limited undressed virgin cover, $24.99, but that's not all. We've also got two limited versions. We've got a black and white version, gorgeous, limited to 250 copies, as well as a color hole copy showing off that kind of now signature laser eye from John Boy Myers, limited to just 100 copies. And again, as Brian mentioned in previous videos, we're not ripping up copies to artificially uh, deflate print runs to create limited collectibles. No, no, no. We followed the publisher rules on all of these and created some unique low print limited collectibles and a little bit of something for everybody. So be sure on Wednesday that you are on simplewinscomics.com or the 616comics.com at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when these will go live. And also, we have those We Only Find Them When They're Dead incentives, including that 1 in 50 Jenny Frazen variant that is sure to be hot fire. Yes, those are those are paired in our bundles and great deals on those because they all come in under ratio. That's right. But with that being said, guys, there's our top 10 for this week. We'll be back with another top 10 next Monday night. Until then, guys, we'll see you in the next video.